Welcome back, hero in need of a haircut, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today we're visiting Hyrule from The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. And just a heads up, while I won't be going over any heavy story spoilers, I'll obviously be showing a lot of locations, so if you really want to see the world for yourself, but you haven't played the game yet, add this to your watch later and come back sometime in the future. Okay? Okay, let's get into it. The world of Tears of the Kingdom is such a wild thing once you think about it. How many sequels completely reuse worlds from the previous game? I guess there are some out there, like Yakuza, but in the case of that series, you're there for the story. In Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, you're there for exploration. How do they evoke that feeling of discovery and wonder when you're exploring the same world from the previous game? That's the thing. It's not quite the same world. It's been like five years since the events of Breath of the Wild. Things have changed. Let's start this off by visiting areas I covered in my Breath of the Wild tour. Should be fun to revisit places and see what changed. There are a lot of areas that aren't doing so well. The lovely old man's cabin on the Great Plateau, the one that was so beautiful at night, has been taken over by the Yiga clan. They set up all kinds of defenses here, and it ruins the nature aesthetic that I liked so much about this area in Breath of the Wild. All of Lurlin Village has been decimated by Ganondorf's forces. This is just terrible to see. So many buildings have been destroyed. It sucks because this was a relatively peaceful place in the previous game. It was secluded and welcoming. And now, it's in shambles. I said I'd want to live here in the previous tour. It's a good thing I didn't move. The fake Master Sword on the Great Plateau is even gone. I came here as soon as I made it to the Plateau and was devastated when I didn't see it. Is there no hope left in this world? Fortunately, there still is. You can actually play a part in rebuilding Lorellin Village. You bring materials to the town and use your newfound abilities to help fix up all the destroyed buildings. The people even come by and give you their thanks afterwards. That was a strong part of Breath of the Wild. It was so satisfying to help people with the world being as run down as it was, and I'm glad to see that there's more of that in this game. Hyrule Castle Town, an area that was in ruins in Breath of the Wild, is in the very early stages of a rebuilding. Towards the front gates, they started to clear the foundations of what were previously wrecked buildings. They even have little stations set up with building supplies nearby. You can actually find similar stations like that all across Hyrule. They're labeled with signs that say, Use this materials cache for all your building needs. These are obviously dotted throughout the world so you, the player, can build stuff with Ultra Hand. But I like the framing of it. Hudson Construction put up all these little caches just for random people to rebuild Hyrule. You're probably not going to get much done with a, like, six planks of wood, but it's the thought that counts. Kakariko Village didn't have much going on in Breath of the Wild. In Tears of the Kingdom, though, Massive Zonai ruins fell right on top of their town during the upheaval. I like that they did that, because it gives Kakariko some flavor. Think about what massive ruins falling upon your city would do. You'd have some people who'd want to study it. Some that are kind of resentful. And tourists! Kakariko has a tourism industry now. This little girl sells wreaths in the shape of the biggest Zonai structure looming over the town. She basically has a little lemonade stand. I think that's adorable. Oh, and remember the one apple under the bridge from the Breath of the Wild tour? It has a friend now. How cute is that? Terrytown saw its fair share of changes. Most of the buildings that were here before have been torn down and replaced. It's kind of a different vibe here. In Breath of the Wild, all the buildings had the same aesthetic, and you were completely surrounded by them in the town center. But in Tears of the Kingdom, the plots to the north don't have tall buildings. They just have little outdoor structures. It feels more open this way. I like it. Hudson and Ronson had a kid. You can actually go in her room and see what it's like. 
I am a sucker for children's drawings in games. It's always so cute and really does a great job at humanizing them. Both drawings are of Gerudo Town, which makes sense because both her and her mother are Gerudo. In fact, a lot of the stuff in her room is from there. You can find a bunch of these rugs and jugs in Gerudo Town. That's such a neat detail, really sells that she's proud of who she is. Oh, one more spot from the previous tour, Makar Island. Did they do anything crazy with it? Uh, there's a chest with a Korok spear. I guess that's something. Ooh, I wonder if the carving we discovered in the Breath of the Wild tour is still there. Maybe they even added something to it. Huh. It's gone now. Weird. What do you say we get to some new areas? Lookout Landing is the first major settlement you come across in the game, and it's a wholly new one settled right at the foot of Hyrule Castle. I imagine it was nice having a little outpost so close to the castle before the upheaval, and now they have front row seats to the gloom pouring out from beneath where it once sat. Despite their proximity to Ground Zero, it's relatively chill here. People are training. Little merchant tents are set up and there's a whole building on the north side of the town dedicated to observing the castle. They even got a big old telescope. This is Pura's show here. Let's check out her living space. The most interesting thing I came across were these drawings of landmarks where the four main races of the game live. Cute to have a little bit of foreshadowing like that if you decide to come in here and snoop around. Not much else of importance. Some sketches of stuff related to the depths. A pair of Pura's glasses on the chalkboard. A mugshot of Zelda and Link. That's about it. Something cool about Lookout Landing is that as you help each of the races with their problems, they'll eventually send someone to hang out here. I've helped out everyone, so it's bustling. Gerudo guard the entrances. Zora are doing some weapon training. Gorons roll about. And Rito fly up in the sky. I like the vibes of everyone coming together to unite and fight against a world-ending threat. They all help in the ways that best suit them. Especially the Gorons, they roll around in circles real well. The most interesting part of Lookout Landing, to me, is the underground area. It's comfy down here. Kinda has nuclear blast shelter vibes. If Ganondorf decides to drop a nuke on Hyrule, the people of Lookout Landing will be safe. There's a lot of people doing their own thing. There's this guy who hears people talking about the Demon King and thinks he's in a dream. His name is... Nappin. Of course it is. Bulliara is hanging out near this table with a map. She's presumably getting caught up on their plan of attack. They have these little colored stones all over the table. I think that's what these are for. Kosi is just working away at this knight's helmet. He doesn't even look up when Link talks to him. What a cool guy. And of course, you have little Offrak, rolling around in circles, working hard. Or hardly working. Hmm. If you jump down a nearby well and do a bit of crawling, you can end up underneath the grate in the underground shelter. Sneaky little place down here. I really do like the aesthetics of caves in this game. There's not really a lot to say about them though, so we'll just appreciate this one. While we're on the topic of underground areas, let's visit Gerudo Town. In Tears of the Kingdom, you get to explore this expansive underground section of the town. Everyone is crowded down here before you come along, but once you help them, most of the people return to the surface. Let's wander these mostly empty halls. Back here is an area with a fair amount of beds. Note the alcoves up above. They might seem awkward to reach at first, but they do have a ladder over here that's probably used just for that. Right beside it is a tiny little bar. It's dark in here. The only light is this dim one placed at the front entrance. 
Something I actually just discovered while writing this is that there's a secret room hidden at the back. After clearing the way, I realized there is nothing in here, just an empty little storage room with seemingly no purpose. But Tears of the Kingdom changed how I think about rooms like this. If this room has nothing in it, what about the room above it? Aha! This is one of the few rooms still occupied by someone. It's a male prisoner who was caught by the Gerudo, as only women are allowed around here. It's kind of sad, because he came here to see his wife and kid, but was thrown behind bars. Link is special, of course, so he's allowed to roam around freely. But there is a quest that asks you to get in here. The guard doesn't want you to, so you have to find some way inside. Link, completely of his own accord, strips off all of his clothes in an attempt to get thrown in jail. Note, I do not condone Link's actions here. What he did was extremely disrespectful and violated the boundaries of everyone around him. Don't be like Link. Sure enough, it worked. If only Link knew he could ascend from the bar supply room, he'd have saved himself some embarrassment. Fortunately, Link can just put on his clothes and be let out. But this guy isn't so lucky. He's doomed to be locked up away from his family. I actually had to double check when writing that, because it feels like you have to be able to help him. It's so sad that you can come down here and talk to him about how he misses his family. I assumed I missed some quest trigger or something, but no. You go talk to his wife and she mentions him in passing, but that's it. There's nothing you can do about this poor soul. They didn't even give him a nice bed. I mean, come on, at least let him have that. Moving on from civil rights violations, let's talk to this lady. She spends her days and nights writing letters to potential partners. Down this little hole, she constantly throws bottles with notes in them, saying that if you are reading this, you are the man she was fated to meet. Sorry, Zelda. I can't deny destiny. I must meet this lady. Oh. Well, that's unfortunate. I'll just leave her to her business. It's obvious I'm not welcome here. Last thing to look at down here is this intense drawing. Look at the way they look into each other's eyes. This is a class for teaching Gerudo women how to interact with men of the outside world. An interesting little insight into how their society handles the fact that men aren't allowed into their space. I wonder how this plays into their lesson for today. I think it's time we finally talk about the Sky Islands. I really like the aesthetic up here. All the yellow and orange makes these areas stand out compared to the greenness of the surface. The geography feels disconnected. Variation in height and wide gaps between Sky Islands lend the game a sense of verticality that didn't exist in Breath of the Wild. As for spots to find, honestly, there aren't a lot. The Great Sky Island, where you start the game, is the biggest chunk of playable space in the sky. Which sucks, because I was so looking forward to exploring more areas like this. The moment where you dive down from way up above, right when you start the game, and start to soak in the environment, it's great. This particular island makes a great first impression. You wonder what this area was used for back in the day. Actually, the game tells you what it was. This is the Garden of Time. You don't get any more info than that, but it's fun to think about what each of these little buildings were for. This was probably for ceremonies. And look at that, it's completely separated from the ground. It's only connected through the stairs. I know all these sky islands are being held up magically or whatever now, but I'm curious how this was supposed to be back in the day. Here's a building where I have no idea what it was used for. Some of the other ones like this you'll come across have boxes that might indicate it was used for storage, but all this has is a lone tree branch. Maybe this was their tree branch storage room? Oh, I completely skipped over the pond you dove into to get here. This is probably another place dedicated to some rituals the Zonai held way back in the past. 
Hopefully they won't find it too disrespectful if I dip my toes in. This overhang is suspicious. I feel like I'm supposed to do something to reveal a secret here, but there's nothing to interact with. I guess you're just going to have areas unintentionally come off with vibes like that when worlds are as big as this one. I like how steward constructs are all over the place, just doing their own thing. This guy is cleaning the area around this tree. This guy is inspecting a raft. This one is, uh, well, I guess he's supposed to be working on the device dispenser? These machines really do feel like the eternal guardians of the Great Sky Island. Hyrule's expansion into the sky wasn't all the Tears of the Kingdom had in store for us. It also expanded the world deep underground. I didn't even know this place existed in the game before playing. I stopped paying attention to the trailers after the first one because I knew this was a game I was gonna play at some point. I didn't need any more spoiled for me. And boy, was it an experience diving into one of these chasms for the first time and seeing what lurked below. Look at this frame right here. This is my first experience with the depths. All I see is this tiny little circle of light surrounded by darkness. I have no idea what to expect beyond the bounds of this area. If you go walking around without a light source, you literally can't see the ground you're walking on. Look at this. The ground is literally pitch black. There could be a massive cliff two steps ahead of me, and I wouldn't know it until I wily coyote'd it. Of course, you are given some light sources to illuminate the way, but it still feels like you're stumbling around in the dark. It's oppressive. Your main goal down here is to light the roots of the… well, light roots. Once you activate one, the whole surrounding area brightens up. But the genius thing about that is that the light roots are almost always a good bit away from the previous one. So even though you're lighting up a bunch of areas, you're gonna have to get used to traversing the darkness if you want to fully explore what's down here. Once you do get a fair amount of light roots set up, the vibe kind of changes. You can see so much further, and the mystery fades away. I guess the sight lines from here all the way down there still existed, but it was pitch black before. Now, it and everything between it are laid bare for all to see. Considering that you can see everything from here to Kingdom Come, it actually reveals that there's not a lot going on in the depths. Well, I guess there are some things to do down here, but it feels relatively dead compared to the surface. One reason is that you don't really come across towns, which makes sense considering the hostility of the environment. The biggest reason, though, is that the terrain lacks an aesthetic variety. If you go to the northwest of Hyrule, you go into the snowy mountains. North leads you to the rocky mountains. Southwest brings you to the arid desert. In the depths, underneath each of those, they look exactly the same. The same green and blue grass all across the depths. If you showed me this landscape, I wouldn't be able to tell you where in Hyrule this is. On the surface, though, Easy. I do think the depths are an overall cool addition to the game, though. There's some cool design elements to it that really strengthen its connection to the surface. First off, every shrine on the surface is directly linked to a light route underground. So if you ever see one of them in your travels, know that on the other layer will be a shrine or a light route waiting for you. The other one is that the topology of the depths is reversed from the surface. High mountains on the surface become deep valleys in the depths. Water pools on the surface become impassable walls that reach up to the ceiling in the depths. It's so cool to have Hyrule recontextualized like that. It's crazy in a way. The overworld was designed for Breath of the Wild, and they just flipped it on its head for this game. Literally. And it completely works. Looking around on the map, the rivers and lakes on the surface forming impassable walls in the depths create such an interesting map. The tips of Dueling Peaks, a spot I mentioned in my Breath of the Wild tour, is one of the highest points in the world. But in between those peaks is a tiny little gap that reaches all the way down to the ground. 
and it has a tiny little river down there. So in the depths, that splits apart the dueling peaks. These tall mountains are changed into deep canyons. What you can normally jump to on the surface, you now have to take an incredibly long detour to reach. Down here, at the very bottom of the northern canyon, it's lonely. The dichotomy of knowing you're both at one of the lowest points of the world, and directly below one of the highest points in the world, it's weird, you know? And in the southern canyon, you're really confronted with that. There's a platform with a pillar reaching straight up into the ceiling. Platforms like this usually exist to give you some quick transportation back to the surface. But knowing where this is, I know it ain't gonna be quick. This is probably the furthest distance you can ascend in the game. It takes you straight from the depths of dueling canyons to the tips of dueling peaks. And I love this spot for that. Let's visit a few more places, rapid fire, then take our final stop at my favorite spot in the game. Behind one of the many waterfalls in Zora's Domain lays the pristine sanctum. This is a secret area not many Zora know about. It's a little hideaway, and it's so cozy in here. The rushing water, with the music fading in and out, it's so lovely. It kind of reminds me of Zora's Domain from Ocarina of Time. That one was underground too. The ambient sound of the water really does make me like this place a bit more, though. The next one isn't really a spot, but I like the snowy version of Rito Village. It was a bright and sunny place in Breath of the Wild, but in Tears of the Kingdom, it's snowing hard. I like that slight aesthetic change and how you really trudge through it when walking. Not much else to say there. And our final quick stop is a place that isn't even really exclusive to Tears of the Kingdom. I regret not showing the Akala region during my Breath of the Wild tour. It's a region I sometimes forget about, but it really is beautiful. The rolling hills and orange trees are lovely. It sets itself apart that way from the other, greener regions in Hyrule. Before I talk about my favorite spot in the game, I'm curious what yours is. Let me know in the comments. I wonder if whatever you come up with can top mine. Okay, you ready? Let's visit the Temple of Time's Roof. I'm sure you can tell, but I love areas that feel like they were important in days long past. It's the developer getting you engaged and making you ask questions about what you think happened here. Because it looks like stuff did happen here. It's just such an interesting design, I can't imagine nothing going on up here. I noticed something earlier. Remember that floating building we looked at on the Great Sky Island? The roof of that has a similar shape to the roof of the Temple of Time. The shapes don't perfectly line up, but the artistic similarities are there. The shape is almost stadium-like in a way, with this central area and the walls sloping upwards at this angle. Though there aren't seats on the slopes, so maybe people stood up top here around the structure. There's just so much to love here. These little dragon fountains. The sand. The tiny water stream surrounding the center path. I don't know, it's just weird up here. But weird is cool. I launched a second channel. I'm continuing my previously Patreon exclusive series where I ramble about things over there. Check the description for a link and go subscribe. But also watch this tour of Super Mario Sunshine. It's got weirdness, just like Tears of the Kingdom. Thanks for watching and see you next time.